Hi, and welcome to the 91 Day Success Podcast. I'm Jonathan, and I am thrilled today to have Nicholas Collins with me. We're going to be chatting about all kinds of interesting stuff today. Nick, I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today. Um, to kind of let everybody know who you are in the 30-second overview, can you give us kind of an elevator introduction to who is Nick? Absolutely, yeah. So my name is Nick Collins. I live in uh, Glen Rock, PA. Um, I consider myself a cubicle escape artist, uh, 97 graduated high school. I dabbled in the, the community college, went to a local college here and quickly realized that wasn't for me. Um, got stuck in a cubicle and started building little websites back in the, you know, God, probably 99. And uh, here I am just early adopter to technology, building websites when you had to piece them all together, have the database talk to the website and uh, just really loved building websites, uh, dabbling in technology. And then one of my first businesses was helping businesses with live chat. So the customer service angle was just something I really enjoyed uh, early on in the game. And here I am uh, I'm now 44 years old and uh, enjoying the life of still being an entrepreneur and not having a boss, not having to be in a cubicle, work from home like today if I want, work from an office tomorrow. Hybrids work really well. Um, but that's really about it. Yes. Yeah, so my day to day now is uh, running my agency with my wife and uh, my small team. Um, we were acquired. Uh, one of our verticals was acquired a couple years ago. So it took a lot of pressure off. Now I can kind of uh, accept clients that I really enjoy working with where prior I was taking anybody and everybody. So it's um, much easier now and, and things are a lot better. Gained a lot of uh, information and knowledge over the years. But here I am uh, still got that entrepreneurial spirit in the fire and it's not going anywhere. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I love to hear that. That's fantastic. I, in reading through your LinkedIn profile and your website and all that, I noticed that you've le started, led and exited, I believe, seven companies over the years. Talk to me a little bit. What's the secret to navigating that? I mean, that's, that's impressive numbers. Talk to me a little bit about as an entrepreneur, how, how do you navigate that process of the, the startup and the, the, the growth and then the exiting process? What's that look like to you? And how have you managed that so well, Nick? Sure. So I always started with that in mind. Um, I've never gotten really, I've never really fallen in love with a business. So back when I was just starting the journey, I was like, man, I want to get in this, build this and then grow this. And then I, I would eventually like to exit and then hand it off. Um, I realized that I didn't enjoy the management so much once things got to a, a much larger level. So the handoff was always easy. So I had a couple small scale acquisitions early on, and that kind of positioned me for bigger and bigger ones. So, and each time I would get acquired, I'd build a little bit bigger team. I'd get a little bit bigger, build a little bit bigger team. And I mean, you're talking, I've sold skateboard shops. We sold diamonds, sold the diamond um, wholesaling company. Um, we, we've done the uh, a public relations company. So each time the teams got bigger, the acquisitions got bigger. But at the end of the day, it was still after that was done. I really loved that. I love being able to start over, start from scratch. But it was always consistent when I got into that startup phase again. It was always I knew that there was going to be an exit in sight. And I, and I enjoy the exit. I love the exit. So from day one, it was that plan of who's my customer? What's the value that I'm going to bring to them? How can I best serve them? Um, is it something that I enjoy doing? Are they going to see tremendous value from it? And then eventually will an investor or will an equity firm or will a, somebody looking to, to buy out my business, would they see value in this? And then could it be a seamless kind of uh, acquisition? And that's kind of always how I want. I've never got into something like, this is my baby. This is my, my dream. And I'm married to it. I've never done that. Even with the skateboard shop, um, Amazon started getting big. I noticed the grandmoms and the moms weren't coming in buying the $300 complete skateboard. So I kind of saw that was coming. So I sold that. And that was one of my smaller ones. And that was, you know, we think we had six or seven kids working for us. That led to bigger and bigger acquisitions. But always it was a, here's the handoff and let's let's move on to the next one. And I really enjoyed that. So obviously in your case, then a big part of that was just planning on that. And that was part of your your goal from day one, then from what I'm hearing is to, to build that and to do so in such a way that it made an exit easy down the road when it made sense to do so, because you had a business that not only provided value to your clients, but also to a new investor that, that, and I'm assuming that applied to everything from processes and the way you were running things and all that on the internal too, so that you weren't there. I know so many businesses I talk to, that's the real struggle is if they sold the business might fold because they're so involved in the day to day. Talk to me a little bit, Nick, about how how have you managed to grow and not get embroiled in those day to day things that so often pull us in as entrepreneurs? 
Yeah. So even from my early days of like the skateboard shop, I always use that as an example. That was one of my first things that I did. Um, I had systems and processes going on. You know, I knew that I didn't, I remember very clearly looking out the window at my skateboard shop and my wife at the time would come by and she says, Hey, mom and I are going to the farmer's market. And I was locked at that skateboard shop till 7 PM. And uh, once that kind of clicked, I'm like, man, I, I want to get out there. I don't want to be in here on a Saturday. And uh, at the time the skateboard shop was doing really well. Online sales were killing it. And the physical retail portion of that was just kind of the icing on the cake. I could offset that. And I had both revenue streams coming. But when I realized that I couldn't come and go as I please, I knew I needed systems and processes. So when I had that 17 year old kid coming in, Jimmy, here's your SOP. Here's how you run the till. Here's how you grip tape that deck. Uh, you know, here's how you uh, upsell uh, to the better bearing. So I had SOPs from a very, very young age. And then when I started to uh, sell the businesses, I was like, man, th these, these, potential suitors really love my systems and processes. They love that they can acquire this as an asset. Um, and even back then I was documenting stuff on video. I'd go up to the skate park. Hey, why do you love skate 911? Why do you love stereotype skateboard shop? And I was building this internal database at the time of content that the, the people that eventually would, buy, would that bought it would utilize. So it was always this process of the SOPs, like you said, the documenting. And then I made sure that I was always able to hop myself out. So even with the last, um, agency that we had, I, I just made sure that I quickly got in, did what was needed, moved the needle and then put the people in place, um, had the SOPs documented. We had the CRMs going. Um, and then I, I quickly did my day to day and then it all kind of did its thing. And that stems back from, like I said, my early days of just Jimmy's at the front. And then I got uh, Christina. She's going to be doing the fulfillment in the back, putting together the boards for shipping. And then Brian's going to be doing the, the packaging for online. And, you know, Nick can eventually head out with uh, Mandy and mom to the farmer's market. And I kind of learned all those pieces of the puzzle over the, the 20 plus years of being self-employed, but didn't, I had to learn it. I had to learn it being knee deep in it. I mean, I was reading books and doing stuff, but that kind of stuff, I don't think I, I could have been taught. I had to figure it out. Man, Mandy had to come to the window and say, get out of here for me to figure out how to do it. <laughs> well, that's awesome though. I mean, I love how the fact that you, you, you were conscious about it. I think so many times as entrepreneurs, we get excited, we jump into something with maybe goals of revenue and that, but we don't necessarily think through what the exit might look like. How are we going to grow the business in a way to, to make it that whether we choose to keep it as an investment because we do love it or whether we decide to sell it in either case, we need to figure out how to get ourselves out of the picture on a day-to-day -day basis so that that can happen. And I know, you know lots of our, our listeners, I know, struggle with that. I have over time as well. And certainly like you have learned a lot of that, but I really commend you on thinking that through and having that plan. That's not something we hear a lot as we interview entrepreneurs as they've gone through it. Now, I know, Nick, you've had a couple of agencies in, in that process. Talk to me a little bit about maybe some of the the biggest challenges that you faced in that web tech industry and maybe the interesting story, if you have one, what have you done to deal with those challenges in that industry in particular? Sure. Yeah. So you and I share the uh, agency lifestyle. We're in the group. We hear the story. So for me, it was always fulfillment, <clears throat> uh, providing the utmost value to clients in the fulfillment. Uh, we're, we're being hired to do a job whether it was a, uh, at the time the, I sold the hospitality and the restaurant vertical. And at the time, these restaurateurs, I say it, they're in at 6 a.m. They're hiring, they're, they're doing the dishes. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at their day and then they're coming home at, you know, 10 p.m. They're there from 6 a.m. till 10. So they're hiring us to bring people in, to promote, to shoot videos. So we have to deliver on the promise that we're bringing them. And my, my pricing model was always month to month. Um, that's been a topic of discussion within the, the 7FA community. Yeah, absolutely. Of, and that, and I, that also ended up hurting my, uh, my acquisition was us always being month to month. But our motto was we, we do what we say we're going to do, or you're going to sever us or you're going to turn us off. As we called it the pay for performance. <clears throat> we perform or we're gone. So fulfillment was always tough. We hired locally. We, we built up this big office and uh, it was a melting pot of, you know, stay at home moms, younger people, millennials, people leaving the workforce. And our criteria was like, Hey, do you post on Facebook? We need social posters. Hey, can you respond to reviews? Can, you know, have you ever written a review? So we got in a nice mix of people, but it was very, very hard to fulfill at a high level to sustain and, and to keep the, the, the team together. Um, it was always a, 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 you know, batting of heads and then, the different uh, strategies and I'm trying to deploy it down and it's going through the different levels. So that was always tough for us, the fulfillment and then the physical office with the manpower. So that's really where um, I struggled with um, 
my prior businesses were more solopreneur, I would say. So this agency, to answer your question, really, I would say the fulfillment, um, the lead getting, the lead generation just came to us. We have really had a formula of really kicking butt, delivering value. Um, we were at every seminar, every uh, mixer. Um, we were really heavy local and our reps were the face of us and our reps killed it. They did a great job. Um, our, our clients they love the reps and that's kind of kept us good. And they kept on referring us. We kept on asking for referrals. So we just built in this, this big giant snowball. And I mean, we always said we dominated our, our local area. And then it started getting out into uh, our resort towns, Ocean City, Maryland, Delaware, Atlantic City. And the next thing you knew, we were, we were growing. And I mean, every couple of weeks I'm putting out ads. And then we actually had to hire someone to help us hire, which I've never had to do. So it really got me out of my comfort zone. And that for me was the, the trouble spot, was keeping the team together, managing the team, the stress of the day to day, and then making sure we could fulfill because if one social rep left us, she would leave, uh, you know, 15, 20 accounts that needed social posting. And if she was only scheduled out for two weeks, that, that, that ticker's ticking. Um, you know, uh, Jenny, the roof for Jimmy, the roofer company, this restaurant, that lawyer, we were a generalist agency. They needed fulfillment. And, uh, she just rolled out with no two weeks notice. And, um, she put scheduled out for two weeks and we need to get that in there reintroduced. So that was always my, my, my trouble spot. And even is now, I mean, I'll be honest, you know, even now with us restarting the agency fulfillment is tough for us. Sure. Oh, and I think that's something a lot of people struggle with and deal with. Talk to me a little bit, Nick, about, you know, reputation. I know your current business platinum reputations is focused on that, but I think a lot of business owners, while they know in, intrinsically that those reviews are important to managing our reputation, talk to me a little bit more about why is it so important that businesses manage that? And in addition to reviews, what other things can they do to, to manage those reputations effectively? Sure. <clears throat> so I was shocked early on. So my business prior started in reputation. So it would be on more personal reputation, one-on-one. -on -one. So someone, call, someone would call me prior to my agency. And this is one that I had sold as well. And they would say, I got a DUI. Um, I'm a, uh, a prominent, um, I own seven auto dealerships. And uh, it's when you Google my name, instead of seeing, you know, Jimmy and his conglomerate of auto dealerships, you see my DUI. Can, can you make that go away? Can you make that disappear? So I started doing that. And it was kind of reverse engineering, bringing stuff up to the top. I would help them uh, rebuild their brand, reestablish their reputation and move on from this disaster. And that really took off. So reputation has always been big to me. My first company, the Web Support Live, the CRM Chat, we would help uh, businesses with their customers and their clients. We'd establish their branding and we would get goodwill all right off the bat. We were their front facing uh, live chat. So reputation's always been really big to me. When we started really picking up momentum, it was shocking for me to discover really big restaurant groups or really big auto dealerships. The guy at the top of the food chain that had to do the, the response to the reviews and the social media. And they were just so wild with their response. What do you mean? My, my crab cake is, is not the best. You know, this would be their response. You don't know what you, you don't know a good crab cake. And that would be the response. And it would create this. <laughs> so we would come in and we'd say, listen, you make the best crab cake, but you can't say that we're going to be your neutral voice. We're going to be your calm. We get it, you know, come back and we'll, we'll make it right. So we saw that angle and that really opened up the floodgates for us to generate leads. We would go in and part of our strategy with our whole team would be, Hey, you make the best crab cakes. Uh, and I see no one's responding to your reviews. You haven't posted since three weeks ago. You're not consistent. Let us help you. And, uh, you know, then we'd get in, as we say, we would kind of put our hooks in, show the value month to month. And then six months later, you know, hey, let, let's redesign your menus. Let's redesign your website. And that formula worked from restaurants back in the day to roofers to, hey, you put a roof on my house. Uh, you did a great job, but I see that you have five reviews and um, you're not posting socially. Can we help with that? So reputation for me was always the foundation. And it was always what I call the foot in the door business. Very easy. It was instant gratification. Um, a lot of my friends do SEO. It was very tough. We struggled with that. It was, what, what, what is your agency doing again? It's hard to show. But for me, reputation was always um, easy to, to prove. We'll help you get more reviews using our systems and processes. We'll help build your brand. We'll help squash any problems you may have. Um, but yeah, reputation's always been big for me. It's been a great lead generator and it's great value that we provide to the, to the client, especially if you have somebody at the top that may be kind of a not the best front facing. And, and I was just shocked, like I said, to see the, the business owners that had no problem getting in defending their baby, which they love, um, but then really creating a, a you know what storm from it. So that's where we would come in and reputation has been really good to us. Well, that's, that's amazing. And I, I think you're so right. It, one thing you said really resonated with me. I remember um, 
when I founded my last agency, Valor Circle, about 12 years ago. And we were probably five, six years in, and we got our first one-star review. And didn't matter whether it was true or not. It was devastating to me. You know, we had a, a time we had probably 100, 100 or so reviews, Ooh. all five stars. Oh. We get we get this one star review. Um, and I remember specifically I started typing and I said, no, Jonathan, you can't respond to this because I can't tell him how wrong he is. It doesn't yes. matter. Nobody's going to care at that point. And I went to our marketing person at the time. We didn't have a marketing director and his name was John. I said, John, I need you to read this and I need you to respond tomorrow and you need to stop me from responding because I want to tell him. I mean, I was mad. I'm like, but but you're lying. That's not the truth. And you know, and it's like he did a great job because you need that third party to get in and go, wow, we and, and he wrote a great one. It was basically probably much like you recommend, but I'd be curious on this. You know, wow, we really appreciate your feedback. While we certainly see the situation of happening and transpired a bit differently, we would love the opportunity to fix this. Would you please reach out to us? And of course, he never did. He never reached out or anything else. But now that's still showing. Now, that was six, seven, eight years ago. That still shows on what is still our only one star review. It's but I think that how we responded to that actually has more value than if we had all five star reviews, because now even in the sales process, we can say, you know, we've got 170 clients that love us uh, and one that doesn't. And everyone's yes. always like, oh, yeah, we've got that client, too, you know, and then they can go look at that review and they can see how we responded. And we didn't pick a fight with them. We didn't tell them they were an idiot. We didn't tell them they were a lying piece of you know what. Uh, we just basically said, thanks. We'd like to fix it. Would you reach out? And they never did. And that was great. And it's it's fine. Um, talk to me a little bit about negative reviews, because I think that's that's hard for any business owner. How do you recommend that that business owner responds when they get a negative review? Yeah, so it is tough. It, it hits you it hits you in the heartstrings. So we always say to our clients and even with us, we always say that when you're crafting your review, whether we're doing it or if it's still in-house, we say that when you're writing the review, you're, you're writing it for the person that left that bad review, but you're also writing it for the other 3,000 people over the next three years that are going to read that. And again, like you said, Absolutely. how you handle that how you handle that pays dividends in the long run. So when you look and you see how hothead the guy is defending his crab cakes, saying that his beer's not flat and how the crabs haven't been reheated, you know, you kind of get a glimpse of that guy, but if it's apologetic and really heartfelt and compassionate, that's the golden ticket. Um, we, we did make the mistake early on where one client that we worked with was immediate. Any negative response was give him a $50 gift card. And we were promoting that. And man, did that that it backfired so bad because then we started seeing all these negative reviews because people wanted that $50 gift card. So along the way we've dialed in our process. Um, but everybody, you know, every business owner wants them gone. Um, so I always say, again, when you're writing that, just keep a clear head. Um, we use uh, AI these days to kind of help us craft it. And then human, another human set of eyes goes on and, and finishes it. Um, we love putting in keywords if we see fit. So if we're working with a, a Medi Spa and, uh, and, a, and a review comes in um, and she just says something like our service, you know, the service from Heather was great. We'll go in there and we'll put in keywords in our response with permission from the, the person that was getting the procedure and our client. And we'll put in those keywords that, you know, Google will pick up and then we'll put in to the Google map view. If, you know, hey, we see that you were in for PDO barb threads and you got some Restylane from Heather and, uh, you know, you got a facial while you were at it uh, because then, you know, Google will come pick up all that and, and it'll show that in in its uh in you know and it's it's google search and in the reviews um so we do stuff like that whether it's whether it's right for your, for your question being a negative review it's usually always about how we can fix it um and then where we potentially went wrong and how we want to make it right uh, and there's always a call to the action in the end and that call to the action that call to action is in our onboarding. Hey, um, Len Stoller, you know, how do you, our auto dealership, how do you want us? What's the call to action? Is it call Bob? Is it email us? Is it live chat? Can we call you? So that's always done in the onboarding. And then our reps from there on out, they, they know the, the systems, they know the processes. If negative, do this. If positive, do this. Don't touch politics. Don't touch religion. Don't talk about the Baltimore Ravens. Don't talk about the Washington commanders. So uh, we got SOPs for all that. So again, if and when we get acquired, that uh, that's all there for the new owner. <laughs> oh, I, I love it. And that makes so much sense on the way you handle it and do that. And I appreciate the response on good, too. I mean, what a great tip. Guys, if you're listening and you didn't catch what Nick just said, when you respond to a review, if you can put in keywords as part of that response, because Google will pick up on that and that helps you out with 
Google Map Pack and other things like that. I mean, if you that's that's gold if you haven't heard of that or thought of that. Uh, don't I have, a, I, have a, I, have a pri- I have a prime example that if I could share really quickly. Please, one day, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. A prime example of that was one day I had a uh, I wanted a Monte Cristo sandwich. So I literally put into Google. This was maybe four years ago. I literally put in Monte Cristo near me in hopes that I would see, you know, Google, Google pull it up on a menu. It was nowhere to be found. But what it did, it showed a Google review from a restaurant, maybe five miles away. And it was a re- review left from a woman. And it said the greatest Monte Cristo I ever had. And it showed the restaurant. I think it was Mother's Restaurant. And I was able to find out that Mother's sold the Monte Cristo, but there was no asset in a website on a Facebook page. Google showed me that review. So ever since then, you know, we eat our own dog food and we say, listen, as much as you can do that. So again, when, when that, that lady came in for that procedure, she said, I had a great service with Heather. What did you have? Can we get as detailed as possible? Did you get Botox? We chalked that in there. So that all pays dividends, but that Monte Cristo, I'll never forget. Cause that, as soon as I saw that, the light bulb went off for me. Well, and what a great example of how that works in real life. I think so often we don't think about that. And we know so much as our, about our businesses. We don't think about adding key words in that. And I think that's just, you know, a tremendous tip. So, yeah, thank you. That That's that's definitely going in the shorts. That was great, Nick. That was, that was good. So, uh, fantastic. Talk to me a little bit about how do you think the evolution of social media over the last decade or so has impacted reputation management or has it not so much? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, so my dark, I always call it my darker days of reputation management management were really dark. I would deal with again, the DUIs, the affairs, the infidelity. Um, I used to, you know, have this, uh, I was a plus reputation and then uh, I got caught and um, now I'm in some deep trouble. And when you Google my name, this is what you see. So I dealt with the really dark days. There was what we would call sextortion, um, sites that would say if you had a sexually transmitted disease and your name, Google would pick that up and put it to the top. They did a documentary on it. So those are my really what I call the dark days. And I would have to work with clients to try to scrub that, to try to make it come to light. And that was hard for me to deal with because it was very gray in what I was doing. Um, you know, I'm going to help this person move on and rebuild. Um, but, you know, what they did was was pretty bad. So that, I consider that the dark days. So that that to me is the reputation of the web, how Anybody can put your name anywhere. Google will pick it up and it's there. And then it's up to you to either bury it or try to get it removed. Um, So things have evolved since then. Google has delisted a lot of those sites, Cheaterville, STD reports. I mean, again, it was dark, dark stuff um, that I was helping people uh, get away from. And I would find out about these sites. And it was so damaging. The CFOs that would come to me, the lawyers, like again, the the big uh, CEOs. So that was very on, man, the web is really, really damaging and really dark. So I sold that, signed non-competes. I don't dabble in that anymore. Don't miss it at all. So I thought, man, let me let me do this now for businesses. Um, things now are, are just, everything's so short. <laughs> I see my son flipping TikToks and the, the shorts, the reels. I see my 75-year-old father-in-law sitting there laughing his butt off at the TikToks and the reels. And I mean, it seems like everything these days has transitioned to the quick, short, bing, bang, boom. Every now and then I'll see people looking at the long form stuff. But yeah, it seems like right now everything is quick, short. Um, you know, Google doesn't get in and penetrate and, and spider and crawl all that stuff. So that that sometimes is a good thing. But um, I mean, I think social media as a, as a whole, the younger generation is coming right out with it. I mean, you know, eight, nine, 10, they are, they know social media. They know the good, they know the bad. Um, and there's a lot of bad, you know, Jimmy is a, is a jerk and he, you know, he doesn't share the ball in basketball and they're getting that taste of how damaging it can, it can be when the friends chime in. So it is, it's still really bad. Um, I, I think reputation is always going to be a business where people like me are kind of in there playing around, trying to help people out, but I don't foresee the damaging aspect of, aspect of it ever going away. I mean, it's, used for so much good. Um, but I do, I, I see it from time to time just with uh, bullies chiming in and just trying to uh, cause trouble. Um, and, and I still see it just not as prevalent as I do back in the old days. But in my world now, it's really just uh, the reviews. Um, is it a competitor that's slandering somebody? Is it uh, defamatory? Is it is it uh, someone that's making up lies? Did they somebody really see a mouse in the kitchen? Was, uh, you know, was that roofer really um, doing drugs on the roof? So that's the kind of stuff that I see. And then we try to get it removed if possible. I always tell my clients there's only one person that can get rid of that and that review per se. That's the, the customer. They can remove that if there's a deal that's to be made. If not, uh, we got to leave a nice response. And, and you know, hopefully that when everybody reads that, uh, you know, it, it, it qualms the situation. But yeah, I mean, as far as reputation in the grand scheme of things, it's 
it's a huge business. And for agencies like us, again, it's a good foot in the door. Um, man, I see you got seven bad reviews in a row. Let us come in. Let us put some NFC cards out, some, some QR codes. Let us get in and do our way and let us earn your business. Then, like I said, the next thing you know, you're, if, if your agency can handle, you're doing websites and other things from there. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I, the stuff that I still see is very, very damaging, but the personal side of it was pretty awful back in the day. Yeah, that definitely sounds like that could be a, a bit dark and, and definitely difficult to work through. So great, great share, though, on how things have evolved and that. So, Nick, as we take a look at, at your history, obviously ha starting, running and, and exiting seven different businesses. Um, my guess is at 44, you've probably got some ideas to do this a couple times again before you're done. Any uh, any crystal ball moments as you look down the road as to areas or industries that you might uh, might be targeting next? Absolutely. So we're, we, you know, we joined the seven FA, um, are, are, are the member, are, are, is your, are your majority of your podcasters familiar with seven FA or is that some, some are, some are not, but feel free to explain it. Cause there's a lot yeah. of them that aren't. So I use the term seven FA and that's just Josh Nelson's seven figure agency where Jonathan and I, we mastermind, we brainstorm, we collaborate. It's just stuff that you're probably stuff that most people are hearing or learning about now were, was probably covered three months ago at a, uh, somebody on stage. So it's a, it's a, it's an eye opener. So the things that I'm learning from seven FA have just, it really makes me feel like I'm sluggish and, uh, it's just been a real eye opener. I'm working with the folks with attacky more. Um, I want to become a better coach. I would love to show people the agency formula. Um, right now I feel that I'm very well rounded as to what it takes to build an agency, to grow the agency, to fulfill it, to uh, provide value to clients. What does the client want? What's going to move the needle? And then to exit if that. So I would love to show people that hate their nine to five, that want to get out of their nine to five. Again, I, I worked for what was called Baltimore Gas and Electric. I was in a cubicle and thank God I was maybe 17, 18, 19, 20 at the time. I forget, but I, that wasn't the life for me. Some people are finding that out now in their thirties, forties, fifties, and they got kids and um, if they want out, man, I'd love to show them how to start an agency. Um, there's a gazillion businesses that need digital help. Uh, I'm growing into where I would love to teach that to people. So that's kind of where I'm moving to love the agency lifestyle, love helping clients, love seeing the dividends being paid from our work. Um, but man, I love helping people. We've done it three or four times, just as case studies, taking a couple people in that are tired of their job. We've showed them how to start it. And they've started little marketing side projects with, uh, myself and my wife's help. So it's kind of what, what we like. And, um, you know, in the bio, I, I think I, I shared with you, we bought like a massive bed and breakfast property. So we have the facility here now to really entertain, share, grow, thrive, and collaborate and, and teach our formula here on site to people that would love to do it. So that's something that's always brewing. And I don't know if that would be an acquisition deal. That would be more be maybe a legacy for my son to take over what dad did and helping show people. Cause that would be really personal, personal and really branded to me. Um, but then again, I'm a sucker for selling out. Uh, so <laughs> who knows, but, um, yeah, the agency life is great, but yeah, I definitely love the one-on-one -on -one working with people and uh, showing them, you know, how, uh, how they can get out of the nine to five if they see fit or if they really want it. Cause you know, it's hard work. <laughs> oh, it is. It is. What a, and I appreciate you sharing some of your thoughts as you look into that. I do think that there's just tremendous opportunities in the agency world for people that want to, like you said, get out of that nine to five. Uh, at the same point, as you know, it's, it's not, nothing is easy and it requires a plan. And so having a good coach to walk you through that could be very critical. Obviously, I think that that's awesome. Well, Nick, you know, one of the things we do here, we talk about this being the 91 Day Success Podcast. And I think you may be one of our guests that's had more starts and exits than anybody else. I'd really love to hear your perspective. The the constraints we put on into this, if you had to start over, you didn't have to worry about your car and your internet and your computer and your food and your house, but you had $1,000 to start a new business. You couldn't spend any more unless you earned it. And you had 91 days or three months in order to build a business that was generating ten thousand dollars a month in revenue, and I didn't prep you for this, so you may you may want to yeah, take you got, that. Yeah, my, my wheels are spinning. <laughs> so, but again, it ninety one days. You got th if I hand you a thousand dollars today, ninety one days. You've got to start a brand new business. What might you do based on your experience in the first three months in order to build that business to have the highest likelihood of getting to that ten thousand dollar a month revenue in the first three months? Love it. That's a great question. Uh, so the one thing that I always do when brainstorming is what I create a clear path to cash. <clears throat> what is my clear path to cash? And what I do is I have a smiley face on, let me see if I could, well, 
I wish I had a better. So anyways, I would put a smiley face on one side of the piece of paper, a frowny face on the other side of the piece of paper, and I draw a line. And what's going to take my client or the, the, the thing that I'm providing from unhappy to happy, whether it's selling, getting a new skateboard, whether it's getting new leads in a restaurant, whether it's a roofer getting new uh, roofing clients. So I, what is my clear path to cash? So with the thousand dollars, I would immediately figure out the business model. What am I going, what value am I going to be pro providing? What product am I going to be creating? Um, then the next thing I would do is I would do a, uh, I'd write on a piece of paper what I enjoy doing what I love doing, where I see the most value of my time going, what is going to move the needle and, and what do I dislike doing? So if that doesn't cost a thing, figure that out. Is there a clear path to cash? Do I see the money coming in? Is this idea so grandiose? Is, are we talking about a, uh, a washer and dryer that does both at the same time and is the most elaborate thing you've ever, the clear path to cash for that is very hard, hard for me to see. It's got to be clear for me. So the first thing I would do is the things that I dislike, I'm not good at, or don't want to do, I would immediately hire someone to do. And a thousand dollars these days goes a really long way on Fiverr, Elance, uh, was it Up, Upwork, um, TaskRabbit. I would immediately figure out what's going to move the needle and what could I have someone do for me that together would really uh, create synergy. Um, and that's how I get the ball rolling. So once the, the, the once there's the clear path to cash, I would start to do what I do best. Um, you know, brainstorm, get the idea. Is there a prototype? Am I providing a service? Um, am I going to be doing a drone? Uh, am I going to be doing videography for, for people? Um, you know, what is, how am I going to get paid and how are people going to end up referring me? So a lot of it's brainstorming and a lot of it's creating that, that path and that clear path. Um, and then how are these, these people on Fiverr going to help with that? So that's probably where the majority of the money would go. And then of course the marketing, <clears throat> How much hustle can I do on my own? Is this a, a door knocking thing if it's local or is this a, a Facebook pixel a paid ads initiative? Um, you know, I would do the research. How much is it going to cost me for a good lead? Um, so that thousand dollars, I'd really make work for me, but I'd be really smart about it. I'd hire experts to do as much as I could. But the majority of it is uh, the brainstorming. I feel like a lot of people that get into business, they kind of don't do enough prep. And then uh, the first obstacle they hit, man, they're gone. And if they're not passionate about it, they're really in deep trouble because the passion, I believe, is what's going to push through. And a lot of this stuff is not monetary. You know, that thousand bucks is really going to get a lot of stuff done that you may not want to do. And it, it could be needle moving. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of mental. Um, where's my customer? I always talk about the fishing rod. You know, you're throwing out a hook. Are you selling exotic cars to people? Well, that that hook is going to be a small pool of people. Are you selling diamond rings to people? That's a, a target audience that you could really find using the right criteria. You know, are you offering something like digital services to businesses? I mean, pretty much any business I know could use better reviews, probably more consistent social media. Uh, local businesses love uh, aerial shots and drone footage. Um, so a very small, very small startup amount these days can go a long way um, in providing value. So that's probably what I would do. So my 90 days would be uh, planning, finding the manpower to help me and then marketing and finding those people. So, um, you know, I, I really think a thousand bucks these days and a good plan can uh, take you a long way. Well, that's great advice and really practical. I, I appreciate that, Nick. It's it's so helpful to hear some just down to earth. There, here's what I do. And again, from someone that's been through that multiple times, uh, I really appreciate your perspective on that. So Absolutely. Well, thank you. I know a lot want of to give every, go ahead. Or no, I was just going to say a lot of people, uh, you know, that I've seen try to start. Nick, I see what you're doing, and they try. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll start with a limited bu budget. They'll, they'll buy the thousand dollar Herman Miller Aeron chair. They'll spend three weeks shopping for the latest MacBook Pro. They'll never get anything off the ground. You know, next thing you know, they're five thousand in debt, sitting on a nice Herman Miller Aeron and the brand new MacBook, but nothing's, <laughs> nothing's moved the needle. So there's what I think is practical. How are you best going to spend the money? And then there's the other side. So I've seen it all, and. Uh, you know, I hope my advice is put the money where it's best spent. <laughs> get the get the Herman Miller later. Well, no, and I totally agree with you on that. You know, in my case, I just recently left Valor Circle, the company I'd founded almost 12 and a half years ago to start a new agency because one of my dreams is to try to figure out if I can replicate what we did there, but do it faster. Yes. Uh, and again, making some lifestyle choices as well, things that I don't want to do, like fulfillment and that type of stuff. And uh, it's ironic you say that because, as you may know from some of the videos I've released in the Seven Figure Group, I spent the first month just doing what projects to bring some cash in because I knew I needed some cash. Yes. But from there on out, then we've been focused on, again, expanding in our niche, doing the things that we want. But if you look, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on a steel case chair. They make wonderful chairs. 
but I bought it for thirty dollars used. Yes. You know, and you know my desk and not not bragging, but my desk is a is a, a Home Depot workbench uh, that raises and lowers, and it's great. But it was like two hundred dollars. Um, yes. You know, and it's amazing. You like you say, I've seen like you so many startups. They get all excited about the technology when I'm working, and not you know, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying the reality is. I'd love a new MacBook Pro, but mine's four years old right now. And you know what? It works fine. Could it be faster? Sure, but it's fine. And I get the job done. And as we start bringing in revenue, I have no problem putting some of that towards new technologies and new toys and, and better stuff like that. But it's kind of like video cameras. You know, in, it, in my old agency, we had lots of video equipment and lots of different cameras. At Whitebeard, guess what we shoot all our videos on? Because so, I already have it in my pocket. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easier. Go ahead. You're going to add something to that. Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing here. Some people are shocked when they see us at a photo shoot and I have, you know, my iPhone in a rig and I'm shooting on cinematic. I'll go home and I'll cut it in iMovie and it makes a very stunning and compelling video. And I've caught flack for that. And we have the expensive stuff, but man, th this thing kicks butt. And the other day I was watching Jake Paul's, uh, his uh, documentary on Netflix. And his thing is, we shoot videos on our iPhone, we cut them on iMovie, and here we are with three gazillion followers. So you don't listen to that guy that says you need that $6,000 Nikon. And, you know, so to that point, I bought a drone. I, I some, some of my clients wanted drones. So I spent $1,500 on the drone. I wanted the ability to send the drone in the sky, draw a, a square around what I wanted to film. And then the drone does all the heavy lifting. It, it makes the most beautiful videos you've ever seen. And I had a, I have a photographer that I hired. He says, Nick, what you're looking at right there is like three to $400 an hour from a drone professional to get what you just did with that $1,500 drone. Long story short with that, we charge a $300 a month for drone, which is dirt cheap. We paid off the drone like in, in three or four video shoots. I literally throw the thing in the sky, push a button and it does it. So it's all about working smarter and not harder. And the technology makes it very easy. So your point, you got the iPhone, 90% of the battle is done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, you know, people ask me, you know, I, I can't shoot video on my iPhone. I'm like, no, really, you can. And it'll work just fine. I actually last night was doing a bunch of video sitting on my back deck, enjoying, you know, the we've got the we actually had a bunch of sandhill cranes behind our house and I was listening to them. And I'm sitting there on the deck recording videos on my phone. Some of those videos got posted this morning. Some are going to get posted over the next couple of days. Um, they're not perfect. And it's just my big fat face talking. But Here's the thing, and I, I want to share this for anybody listening, and I, I'd love your perspective, Nick. When you do that regularly, you are helping your reputation. You are helping your search engine optimization. You're helping everything that you're doing as a business owner to promote your business. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, the, the video I did last night, I wasn't paying attention, and the sun was a bit behind me, so I was washed out. I could have reshot it, but you know what? I checked one of the videos I uploaded this morning. It's already had almost 600 views. It looks doesn't look good, but it sounds good. And that's all that matters. The sound was great. And those are 600 people. What you know? I always ask myself, what would I pay to get in front of 600 people yes. that wanted to hear what I had to say? I mean, I, I candidly, I, I just got invited to a speaking gig in, in February. Uh, I'm going to be out of state. I'm going to have to travel 16 hours to get there on my own dime. I'm going to spend a couple nights in hotels. What? To probably talk to a group of about 500 people that want to hear what I have to say. And yet I can pull out my mobile phone and I can do it in minutes. And maybe it's a different audience. That's a fine argument. But if I do that regularly, we've never had the opportunity like we do today. And sorry, I'm on my soapbox. But to be able to promote ourselves and our business in a, an effective way, literally in the palm of our hand. That's, that's so true. And sometimes some of my clients will say that video only got 220 likes. And I'm like, yeah, but we posted four times that week. And then you compound the 200, the 400, the 50, you know, that all compounds. And then in with all that, it's the sharing, the interaction. It does, it, it always pays dividend. And there's no downside to that whatsoever. You're building practice, you're gaining momentum, the snowball starting the roll. The problem is, is the people that never get started that have that $6,000 camera and they don't upload anything because it's not perfect. And, you know, all of us in the agency world and just in the business world have heard of about the, you know, the, what is it, the paralysis by analysis and the uh, perfectionism, the, the enemy of uh, execution. That, that's one of my favorites. It really is. It's perfection is the enemy of execution because if you just get it out there, man, you can get seven, eight, 10 out before maybe your potential competitor gets one out six or seven months later. So for me, it's all about compounding and volume and just practicing. Like I said, um, you know, 
if I 20 years ago would have thought that I would have ever been acquired for what I was acquired for and where I'm at now, I never would have thought that, but it took a ton of, ton of, ton of tiny little steps. And each step, I learned a new skill. And then each skill compounded and compounded and compounded. And whether that was team building, whether it was fulfillment, whether it was me being knee deep in the technology, wanting to learn how high level works. I didn't want to have to relearn high level after becoming com comfortable. But now that I am, I'm like, <laughs> you know, so. absolutely. It's tons of tiny little steps. And if you're sitting there with the wheel spinning or any any of your listeners are sitting there waiting, you're going to be waiting in the wheelchair. You're going to be looking back on the, I always told Tony Robbins always told, told, tells us the rocking chair test, sitting on the rocking chair. What did I not sitting on the, you know, the 87 year old man sitting on the rocking chair? Why did I wait so long? What, why didn't I? And it's just get started. You know, so many people are critical of the feedback they may get. That video sucks. Or again, that Jake Paul documentary was how he started from nothing. And now, everybody. He's a household name and like, he's still posting with his iPhone and still cutting on Mac iMovie. And I mean, the technology these days with GPT and Munch, and I mean, you and I could sit, I mean, we, we do, we sit there and talk about oh, it yeah. at these conferences. I mean, it just makes it so, I mean, in our agency, the things that AI is doing now, it's just, and you're the AI master. And I'd love to invite you back to my podcast to talk about that because I'm sure we're not scratching the surface of what we could be, but it's just, uh, you know, to your point, you're out there shooting with your thing, with your uh, iPhone, and it's just going to look absolutely stunning. Would the brand new Nikon be better? Probably just a smidge. <laughs> yeah, it, it reminds me of the old 80-20 rule. We can get, yes. but but instead of getting 80% there and 20%, we can get 95% of the way there on 15% of the work. And most importantly, if you're in a startup, like we've been talking about, for 10% of the budget. Uh, and that's that's critical. Well, Absolutely. Nick, if people are, are listening and they hear what you're doing for reputation and that, and maybe they want to reach out and learn more about you, let's say they're in their car, they're they're wrapping up. What's the best way, Nick, for them to reach out to you and to learn more about what you're doing at Platinum Reputations? Absolutely. So my personal website is just my name. It's nicholascollins.com. Just talks about my journey, my path. I talk about how I, I worked at Maryland Public Television, and that's my number one secret was something that I learned from Maryland Public Tele Television. If you go to nicholascollins.com, you can read about that. It's pretty cool. Um, and then my agency, my generalist agency is platinumreputations.com. That's where everybody kind of gels together. We have all of our social proof, uh, which is my claim to fame. Um, I just love showcase. I love having clients talk about me. It's There's no better proof in the pudding than when you have a client telling others how good you are. You can, you, Jonathan, you and I could talk all day about how good we are, how good our agency is, but everybody's doing that. When another client says, these guys got me 15 reviews in a month and before I couldn't get one in 30 days. I mean, that's compelling and it's honest, it's transparent and you can see the proof in the pudding. So Platinum Reputation showcases all of that, the results that I got. And I'm very, very open and transparent. I love helping people. So please feel free to reach out. I'm, uh, I'm always available. So those are my two channels. I love it. Thank you. Well, and if you stuck with us through the whole podcast, as always, I want to thank you. Uh, I think that Nick has dropped some tremendous value today. Nick, really thank you for joining us on the podcast today. And uh, seriously, if you've got questions about reputation, reach out to Nick and his crew. They do an amazing job and they can help your business look better online. With that, guys, make it a great day and we will see you on the other side.